Welcome to episode 571 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Jen Hilton, and he's Jaleel, a.k.a. The Purist, and it's another international break. Perfect time for Barcelona, because they've only won 10 unbeaten, and well, by one, I mean 10 unbeaten, you get what I'm saying, and with the international break, it is always a great time to have on The Purist, because we get to talk about the big ideas, the big pictures, and kind of the present and the future at the same time. So with that, I say The Purist, Jaleel, how's it going? It's going all right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me on. It's been a little while, but uh, yeah, pretty excited to talk some uh, some more Barcelona tactics, general stuff. Um, it's a pretty interesting time right now. There's just a lot of uncertainty, uh, which makes for can make for a really interesting conversation. So yeah. Well, I always do find, I think, in the last few seasons, so I'm basically saying the post-Messi era, because Messi really was, in all of these discussions, the cheat code as to, well, what could Barcelona do better or what's going to happen here? It's basically whether or not Messi is going to rescue them. And I would say that from 2018-ish on, that had been the case. And then since Messi, I find when Barcelona are on a better run of form, that is when there are even more questions because that is when you begin to ask, well, Barcelona are doing well now. They're showing you some good things as opposed to how do you fix this problem? I think it's actually more complicated to say Barcelona look like they're fixing things and they look like they're on the up. So how do they actually progress this and become one of the better sides that I think so many Kool-Aids expect them to be, which is what they haven't been, obviously, for the last three, four years. So I think in this conversation, we're going to talk quite a bit about, as I said, Barca's present. And then some questions about Barca's future is how do you take that next step forward? And I think a better also way to call this first segment would be tactics versus form. Because I think this is international break. I know it's frustrating because of that momentum that you feel like might be lost, which is possible. But those questions that have come up in good ways about Barca's 10-game unbeaten streak. What that means is since losing to Athletic Club in the Copa del Rey and Villarreal in the Liga, Barca has beaten Osasuna, Alaves, Celta, Mallorca, Napoli, and Atletico Madrid, and they have drawn Granada, Athletic Club, and Napoli. And when I say tactic versus form, that all coincides with Xavi saying he's leaving, right? So I think the most important part that we start with, instead of kind of going over all the different reasons tactically or some of the things that have happened, I think it's important to kind of ask you straight up in terms of the game. I think you and I get into the habit of saying and looking at the numbers and saying, well, this change happened or this decision was made and therefore this has all worked. Do you think or how much of this do you think this unbeaten run has come from the emotional impact of Xavi basically saying, hey, it was fun while it lasted, but I'm going to kind of throw you guys into chaos, but I hope that chaos unifies us. I honestly think that it hasn't had as much of an impact as people probably think. I think it, there's just been a lot of things that have converged at once that have helped uh, the team, um, which is obviously surprising given a couple of the injuries. But obviously, I think we'll talk about that um, on the you know on the, the the playing level. But you know, we we often underestimate how much things like pressure and confidence and these these intangible things that are impossible to measure can have on a football team. And it's really difficult for us to sit here and say, this is why this player improved, you know, in terms of confidence or in terms of, um, you know, their form. Players like Kunde, Araujo suddenly performing versus playing, you know, probably the worst football of their time at Barcelona. That is going to make a huge difference. Um, You know, somebody like Kubasi coming in and being uh, an excellent um, build-up player from the base of that that structure makes a huge difference. Um, Lewandowski scoring goals when he previously was missing makes a huge difference so you know there's just a lot of uh, intangible things that have come together that have helped Barca gain results over the past 10 games or so Uh, I don't think that necessarily changes the fundamental um, you know positives and negatives of this team overall I think we shouldn't take this uh, run as a sign that Barca are fixed completely uh, or that, you know, things are terrible. It's just not enough of a sample size, essentially, to, to to make that call, I would say. Well, it's funny because I have four big reasons that I have in front of me as to what have all coalesced to Barcelona. Just feeling, and it, it really is that gut feeling you have. And again, our eyes also tell a lot of the tests, and that's the story with football as well. It's why when you don't watch the games, you kind of have a conversation with someone and you can tell, who hasn't been watching and who has, because the four things, and you actually, it's funny because you mentioned all four of them. 
And I do find in our tactical discussions, it's difficult to separate all four of those, we'll say, pieces of the spider web because they all do coalesce to make a team improved and make it all work together. But the four things that you said, which I had as well, in the last 10 games, and since Xavi announced that he's leaving, we've seen the emergence of Pau Gabarsi to not only being just a player, but to be, I mean, an essential part of the team, the man of the match against Napoli, yes, but he's had an argument to me as the man of the match in all of these matches. And I think he has been Barcelona's best, not defender, defender, but most impactful defender on both parts of, or both areas of the ball is in when Barcelona have the ball out of possession. And even defensively, he's done everything he's been asked of. So the emergence of Pau Gabarsi, to me, I'm, I'm, this is in no particular order either. As you said, the emergence of Pau Gabarsi, Lewandowski score again, quite simply. Christensen as a defensive midfielder and not change and committing to that idea and sticking with that idea. And then, as you also said, Araujo and Koundé discovering their form. And those four things all happened at the same time, right? And I think it is really difficult to pick apart, well, why did all of those things happen? Because they, they all work in, in such tandem. Araujo and Koundé, as they've been rediscovering their defensive form especially, and then Koundé getting forward a bit more, the factors to that are his partnership with Lamini Mall, in that once Rafinha had gotten injured, it became Lamini Mall and Koundé, and that trust and that partnership was finally built with some consistency. And with Pau Gabarsi's uh, ball-playing ability, I don't want to under uh, underestimate any of that. That is less mental labor for Araujo, who can really just focus on defending and commanding that back line. And I almost want to add a fifth here that I've said before, too. Ter Stegen coming back for Naki Pena, for all that we don't see of what he does or says on the field and that confidence that his back line has in him, whether to make the saves or to command his box, especially, that was an issue with the Naki Pena. So again, all of those things, injuries and timing, all of it coalesced at the same time. But if you were to say what, or have noticed, did Xavi do certain things or am I just kind of pointing all that out and it became chemistry and familiarity and I guess, as we say, a perfect storm of all of those things happening at the same time that kind of took pressure off of Barcelona and allowed them as a unit to succeed a bit more. Yeah, to Stegen was one that I was going to mention as well and it's actually a big one, I think. You know, there's a lot of people underestimate really the, and I've seen it happen before, the impact of, you know, small um, improvements in, in, or sometimes big improvements in specific areas of the pitch. When a, when a team has such a consistent and um, clear game plan as Barcelona with certain players and certain skill sets being so important, such as ball playing center backs, ball playing goalkeeper, ability to find free man in different situations, you know, that translates to, to uh, a game that is so much more fluid, that is so much more consistent. And it's 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 almost like Barca fans, and I've said this before on this podcast, that Barca fans expect, uh, you know, a manager to be able to do anything with anybody. But no, you've seen the difference in Barca's ability to play out from the back when you have a Kubasi over, you know, a, a, a an Igor Martinez or a Christensen or whoever, and the same goes for you know uh, Tostegan over in Yaki Pena. It just makes the team so much more consistent, and it, those minor you know or sometimes major increases in in you know passing ability, in ability to identify where the space is quickly. All those things make such a massive difference when you know Barca are up coming coming up against teams who most of the time know exactly how they're going to play. So it's uh, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that those two ingredients have added a lot of value to Barcelona's possession. Well, let's focus on Lewandowski for a second here, because when we say he's scoring again, in this run of 10 unbeaten, he has seven goals and three assists, which is arguably his best stretch of his Barca tenure. And the only other example would be going back to last fall in September, and October, when he was really scoring. I think it was something like nine in 11, which would be better than that. But prior to the unbeaten streak, he still scored in both the semis and the final of the Spanish Super Cup. So this was kind of building. And his drought this season came in October through December prior to his ankle injury and after the injury, which I find interesting because we know that I mean, based on substitution patterns and the amount of ground that, that players cover, that you generally do get rid of or substitute out midfielders before you choose to substitute out the center forward, even though 
Vita Roque again uh, arrived in January, and Mark Tadieu has been available for minutes, uh, and Ferran Torres has generally been healthy, recently got hurt, of course, and Jao Felix has been available all season long, even though coalescing, as I've been saying, with this unbeaten streak or run of form, not to Jao Felix's credit, but he's basically found himself on the outside looking in. That's been another part of this uh, unbeaten run as well, that Jao Felix is not being relied on as much. And Again, it's not one of those things. It's not saying, well, once Xavi kind of looked away from Del Felix, uh, when his job, I guess, was no longer on the line, if anything, and he felt like he didn't have to protect Del Felix for the future, then Barcelona started winning. That's not, again, correlation is not causation here. There are so many different factors. But in the case of Lewandowski, I do find it interesting that especially, especially that win against Napoli or even the 0-0 against Athletic Club, I found an Athletic Atletico Madrid, he had the goal, of course, the, the, the miraculous goal. But I do find that Lewandowski, you could tell the less involved he is, but he's still making an impact. Then there are games where it looks like he's trying to be more involved or trying to do too much. And it just seems like the game is coming to him over the last month as Barcelona are, are improving and playing better as opposed to him trying to reach for the game. And that is where you see the accusations of, well, he's over it, he's past it, or his... First touch is too heavy. He can't play in build-up situations anymore. And and basically all the criticism of Lewandowski, those are gone, even though, as I've said, like the amount of touches he has has not gone up. If anything, it's gone down in this unbeaten streak. But he just seems like his impact is more involved in the moments that he is involved. And he's creating space much better for everyone else. That's why I said, especially Fermi Lopez, I think it's no secret that after that athletic club match, Fermi Lopez had now three straight games of not even good form, but impacting the game in those middle channels, being the late runner. And that has kind of, to me, seemed like it has coincided with Lewandowski choosing to get out farther to the wings a little bit more and create a little bit more space for those central channel runners, including Gundogan, who now has support from Christensen. So again, not to take away the whole idea, but it, it is all so connected. And is there anything more that I'm kind of missing on the Lewandowski idea? Um, I do think Gundogan, although this wasn't the case against Atletico, the fact that he's been playing more as an uh, interior, as a, you know, essentially a 10, one of those two 10s uh, either side of Lewandowski, rather than consistently as a pivot um, before the Atletico game, I think that makes a huge difference because he becomes the the focal point, essentially, um, of when Barca break the lines, they look for him rather than having to look for Lewandowski, who then is bouncing you know, balls back into the midfield or whatever. So it takes away a creative burden from him that he wasn't performing very well. He wasn't linking up very effectively. Uh, and Gundogan has just been so incredible. And those two have obviously been developing a relationship now. And you can tell that there is a, a good understanding between them. And I think that has an impact as well. I mean, you know, Lewandowski has always had that player... Uh, alongside or behind him you know whether it's Thomas Muller so that this Gundogan uh, role when he's more advanced kind of mimics that in in a certain way and allows Lewandowski to play his best game which is inside the box I mean who is the guy back before he went to Bayern Munich when he was still at Dortmund that was the guy well that guy was this guy in, in Gundogan not entirely Gundogan for Dortmund played a little bit farther back and it, that was also many years ago for both of them so I, I don't after all this time I don't know what has carried over because even over the course of 10 years, Lewandowski is a striker, sure, but they're different players. They're potentially even different people. And it's it really is hard to go back to the Dortmund years and think like, oh, you'll just pick it right up from where you were the first time and it'll work out exactly that way. All right. I think we've gone over the things that people are comfortable with and know about. And I think you and I, as I said, we're gonna have, we're not very good at stepping too far outside of our comfort zone, but that's exactly what I'm going to do to us here, right? I'm going to throw some water on our face because in this last stretch, and that being the last three matches, when Pedri and De Jong went down against Athletic Club, so the sample size of Barcelona winning is the Athletic Club when they went down, and then Mallorca, Napoli, and Atletico Madrid. So basically three matches and 70% of the Athletic Club match without Pedri and De Jong. And... I do tend to, shout out to those who've been saying it for a long time, but I do tend to ignore those in my comments, especially when I answer the Frankie de Young question, because as I've said, de Young's contract is such that if he chooses not to leave in the offseason, it is up to him. Barcelona cannot, even if, and they've been trying to, 
they cannot force him out. If De Young says, I want to stay, the next Barcelona manager or if Xavi stays or whoever has to say, De Young is a major part of my program. He's a major figure because not only does he make that kind of money, but he's going to be a part of this squad because he chooses to be a part of this squad. And he could do it until 2027, I believe, when, when his contract is up. And Pedri is a similar thing where I think Barcelona would love to continue to protect him and have him. And they understand. And I went over it last summer. I've gone over it that Pedri is an excellent player. And Barcelona, in the sample size since he arrived at 16, are a better team with him in it. And that has been the case for three years. And again, a stretch, a stretch of three and a half games is not going to change my mind on that. Uh, and again, Gabi's absence is also a huge part of this equation, as well as what you do for the future. All that said, I want to make it difficult for you and I with this conversation and kind of, we'll say, give attention to those who say, are Barcelona better without Pedri and de Jong? Do Pedri and de Jong do certain things or don't do certain things that do limit Barcelona a bit in control of the game, getting forward, and even defending? Is Barcelona a bit more we'll say linear in the jobs that they have where you have these players to do these things, these players to do these things, and everyone doesn't have to do a little bit of everything the way it does feel to make up for, let's say Pedri's lack of this or De Jong's lack of this or dribbling too much or whatever, or taking too many touches, whatever it is. Is there some credence possibly to Barcelona being a bit better without Pedri and De Jong? Okay, so what I'll say is that the way that this Xavi team has evolved, it hasn't suited either of them for the better, I would say. The reason for that is that across, you know, the shifting of formation to now the 3-2-5 sort of thing, um, the fact that those positions have become more rigid over time for the fact that Xavi wants a more consistent counter-press. He doesn't want players out of position because he wants to know that they're going to be there when Barca lose the ball to try and win it back. There's also the fact that uh, generally Barca are playing more conservatively now, um, less big diagonals, big switches of plays, uh, more patience. And again, it's all for defensive purposes. And that has led to a more rigid system. The players don't move from their positions very much. And because of the nature of the positions in this 3-2-5, Neither of them are perfectly at home. Now, Pedri is the obvious one because he's played mainly as one of the two interiors. And those players don't see the ball very much. Um, they're basically there to sit, occupy a, a centre-back or a full-back, and then uh, move into space between the lines when Barca break the lines and be found in space and then uh, create chances into, inside the box. And that means most of the time they're just running, they're occupying. Because Barca have become more patient, they don't move the ball into the final third as quickly. And so those players don't see much of the ball. And that hurts players like Pedri and even João Felix, actually, because they want to see more of the ball. And Pedri wants to be influential over more uh, phases of the game. And so when you restrict, restrict him to just, you know, back to goal, occupying a defender, you know, playing one touch passes and occasionally turning and threading a through ball, that's you just limit him fundamentally. And he's a much better player than uh, a role like that can give you um, opportunities to show. And uh, obviously, a player like Gundwan has understands that role perfectly and it suits his ability to turn in space and he's, his awareness of those pockets is incredible and he's been learning that under Guardiola for, for many years and so you know he's very very good at it. Pedri you want him to be involved in more phases and so it hurts him being in that position. For Pedri before we get to before I, I get you back to the young I think it's totally fair to say that Pedri is a better player and I I don't, if you want to argue with me about that, have, have fun, do it in the, the comments or hit me up wherever on social media. If you're listening to this, Pedri is a better player than Fermi Lopez. But I, I think Fermi Lopez, as we've seen recently, if he's able to find form, he's a better fit in this system than Pedri is because of as a high interior, what he's being asked to do. But I think Pedri, when I talk, when, when we do, we talk about his ball retention and we speak about his defensive instincts. He's a better player, all around better player than Fermi Lopez. But Fermi Lopez, just, he just looks more comfortable here. 
Yeah, and Firmin also brings more intensity when you're in that position higher up the pitch. Uh, Xavi wants a lot of intensity and co ground coverage from that interior. So the ability to press with intensity, he's constantly running for me. In the same way that Gavi did in that position, he's because Barca, in my opinion, are not defensively well organized in a lot of phases, especially during the press this season. Um, you know, they're, they're, those players are having to cover multiple positions and multiple players and essentially run themselves into the ground. And obviously, Firmin is much better at that than Pedri because he's just got the legs and Pedri doesn't. Um, so, you know, Firmin, yeah, I agree with you that Firmin is a better fit for that specific position because we are talking about specific positions in this system. That's just how it works. We're not talking about, you know, this isn't Ancelotti who lets his guys just roam around and do whatever they want. Xavi's putting players in specific positions to do specific jobs. And yeah, so Pedri's definitely... Um, uh, hurt because of that and I would say the same goes for De Jong because he's also a player that wants to move around probably even more um, and De Jong with De Jong it's a bit different because you know you can directly replace him with Gundogan and you don't lose that much so you don't lose uh, his ability to dictate tempo you don't lose his technical ability you obviously lose his ability to carry and drive through lines and, and things like that but if you if you've got a, a, a well set up um, structure and players are moving to retain distances and you know you, you you're progressing with the ball, you don't need somebody carrying the ball through the lines necessarily. So you don't lose a lot when you substitute uh, De Jong for Gundogan. So you know obviously in an ideal world you'd have De Jong deeper and Gundogan further up. Um, but in this small sample size that we're looking for whether it's Gundogan or, very surprisingly, Sergio Roberto, um, they've both done a similar job in possession with probably more positional discipline than uh, De Jong generally would do. Now, you, the, the caveat is that Barca have played, um, you know, only certain types of teams and against teams that are going to sit really deep. Uh, De Jong is just really essential because of his passing and his ability to uh, play the ball over mid blocks and play the ball in behind um, even you know lower blocks into runners. So against certain opponents, I, I do believe the sample size is too small. So we, you know we can't say that he's uh, surplus to requirements at all. But you get a decent level of what he can do with certainly Gundogan and Sergio Roberto against Atletico was. I, I, don't, I pro think it's probably the best I've ever seen him play <laughs> for Barcelona. He was incredible. Awesome. Um, but yeah, two with young, two small sample size, and you've got similar replacements. And with Pedri, uh, yeah, it, the, the role that he's been playing doesn't actually suit him that well, which makes me very interested. And I know we're getting onto this at some point as to how, as to who's going to take over and what direction they're going to take the team, because given a different set of restraints for the players, given a different system, uh, these two could and really probably should be fundamental because they're two of the best ball players. I mean, for me, Pedri is Barca's best player still. And and again, if people disagree, like like you said, you can come at me, but I still believe that. Um, and yeah, in a in a different system, these two guys could actually be the you know the by far the most important players, which which is going to be very interesting going into next season, I think. Yeah, I mean, the two players that I'm kind of going to bookend this conversation with, we didn't mention Lamini Mall's name much. I just brought him against Kunde because Lamini Mall is such a great fit just as a right winger that creates a double team, that creates an additional defender to slide over. And I mentioned it on the five headlines. That's why we're really not talking about Athletic Madrid, uh, Atletico Madrid and that win too much. Yes, it's been a few days as well, but I, I, I really did after those five headlines feel like I'd covered everything about what Barcelona did so well against them. And as I said, Rafinha has, I think, really succeeded in the last, what, two weeks because Lamini Mall has just been so dangerous and teams are now aware of his danger and they can't stop him because he can go around you. He can kind of even go through you. He can dribble 1v1. And that danger is creating so much space for everyone else. I think I want to just make sure I credit him here. We're not talking about Lamini Mall uh, too much today just because I think what he does... Uh, essentially is as, I mean, he really is playing like a star right now. And what he does is kind of straightforward. 
where to the point, I really like the point you made about the teams and the profiles that, that Barca have done well against, because I do look at the last now four victories, Athletic Club, Mallorca, Napoli, and Atletico Madrid. Those are all teams that press you. And you spoke about, and you mentioned Barcelona struggling in the defensive phase of the game. And that's true. And I think why it kind of gave words or vocabulary to why I really get that sense that Kubarsi has been Barcelona's, along with Lamini Mall, best player for the last month. He has been. It's been those two. two a 17 and 16-year-old, and we get caught up in that age, yes. But I think the fact that Kubarsi is as press-resistant as he is. The, I mean, you're going, you, we really are going right back to PK as far as a, a defender who can be that press resistant with a ball at his feet. I, I, I mean, Barcelona have not had another one in a bit of time now. And him being so press resistant and his ability with the ball to break through lines or go over the top. And that was what was so dangerous against Napoli and Atletico Madrid, where Kubarsi from the middle can hit you in all ways. And, and that is also mean that Christensen does not have to receive the ball to feet and turn and Kubar C has been so good that to bypass Christensen and say, all right, Christensen, your only job is to protect the back line, allow Gundogan to get farther forward because Kubar C, he's the one spraying those diagonals. He's the one or getting it over the top. Or if they're going to press back to Ter Stegen, Ter Stegen is just going to either hoof it to the sidelines where it usually goes out of bounds for him. I don't know what his, I don't know what his uh, pass percentage is with the balls to the wings, but it cannot be higher than like 40%. But then Ter Stegen, I think with the ball over the top, uh, that's pretty, I mean, because even if you do that and it works great, of course, you're in on goal. But it, even if it doesn't work, you have the opportunity to win a second ball, which to your point, Sergio Roberto, my eyes bugged out of my head because of how many aerial duels and how he was in the perfect position over and over again to win those 50-50 balls that we've basically said he hasn't won in three or four years. And we've said he's over the hill. It's not going to happen. But he wound up winning all those balls and being in the right spot over and over again. But I said, I go back to it, that Kubarsi to me has been Barcelona's most important player. Maybe not even best. I think that's that's too redactive, but um, too reductive, I mean. But I think he's been their most impactful and important player because of how press resistant he is. And I think that's what's so exciting about him is what he could potentially open up as the team does all come back. Like what happens when hopefully by next December, January, February, again, I'm kind of, I don't know when he'll be back back. You know, the difference between being on the field and being back to his best when I talk about Gabi. And in the case of Gabi, I'm hoping he's feeling almost 100% Gabi by basically a year from now. Hopefully by January, February, March, even if he's played a few weeks and months, hopefully by that point, we see him back to his best. Hopefully by next spring, that's generally how long it takes. He also is young, so who knows what happens. But to see Gubar C in this role and Lamini Mall in his role and potentially Gabi back to his best, that's the exciting thing to me. And instead of allowing you to wax poetic about Kubarsi, I kind of took that job. I'm going to throw the other awful question at you for, uh, for you. And it's that Barcelona's biggest issue in the offseason is going to continue to be they don't have a defensive midfielder. They don't have one. And they, I, I, to warn everybody, they probably won't have the money for the player that will solve their problems. You and I have looked at it. I've come out basically every year now for the last three years with a... Uh, defensive midfield replacements. And each summer, those players, even the ones that were on the wish list, they go to another team and there aren't even the players there that were going to be the answers to Barcelona so many times over and over again to the point where I go, well, if Rodri's not coming, then I don't think Barcelona are going to find the answer. And then people kind of talk themselves into other players up and down the list. If it's not Mark Bernal or Pau Prim or the best version of the defensive midfielder pivot or whatever for Barcelona coming out of the academy, could Pau Cabarsi play the defensive midfield role? Is that something that uh, kind of piques your interest? Because I poo-pooed the idea of Christensen at defensive midfielder because I said it was more important to have it a, a, uh, as a center back. And hey, I was wrong. And I have to say I was wrong up front now. But Cabarsi is the next question mark for that. That if our Barcelona is so in dire need of a player to do something that they might commit to the idea of taking a 17-year-old and saying, hey, can you play defensive midfield at the top level? And then we'll trust that we have enough center backs, including Mika Faye as well. If you, depending how you uh, get him to figure it all out, do we have enough options at center back that Kubarsi has to be our answer to defensive midfield because we don't have any other answers? Uh, I think there's two parts to the answer. The first part is acknowledging that we don't know how important that role is going to be because we don't know what system of football Barca are going to be playing next season and beyond. Mm -hmm. So obviously if there is a, if, if a positional play coach comes in, and tries to evolve or expand on what Xavi's doing right now, 
then a pivot becomes extremely important. Uh, priority number one, because the way the ball circulates through uh, a team like that, they're just the epicenter of everything. Um, if uh, somebody like Flick comes in, the game plan changes completely. And then, you know, you're looking at a different type of player that would fulfill that role. So that's, you know, one part of the question is that we don't actually know how important that a specific type of player in that role is going to be. Uh, but the second part is, and the reason why it was hard to speculate on Christensen is because we as observers of centre-backs simply cannot know whether they will translate well to a, a midfield position because what they're doing in the game doesn't give us any evidence or clue whatsoever because they constantly have the whole game in front of them. And yes, we can assess things like passing range. We can assess things like speed of thought. We can assess uh, probably defensive awareness and positioning, but we have no idea how they're going to respond to, oh, now you're receiving with your back to goal or now you're receiving under pressure. Um, and, you know, there are so many more decisions you have to make as a defensive midfielder, as a midfielder of any kind, um, that it, we just can't, we simply can't know. So Christensen, you know, he's he's kept things extremely simple in possession, he's not progressive at all. He just plays the simple one-touch pass to the guy, whoever's closest to him. And that is uh, acceptable as long as you have other good progressive players around you. It's not the perfect solution because he's still a bit shaky, um, you know, under pressure. And yeah, he might he might develop that, but who knows? Uh, unfortunately, we just, we just don't know with somebody like Kubasi. And I would suggest that he... I suppose, like you said with Christensen, really, is so important as a defender building up from the back that and has such the perfect skill set for that, that it seems it would seem a little bit pointless or counterproductive, perhaps, to move him further forward um, and make him become a defensive midfielder. I just don't I just think the value that he brings as a centre back is, is, is far too high. I, that's where I always agree with you too. When I see a player really excel in a certain role, instead of taking the idea that, well, they can solve another problem, they're currently solving a problem at such a high level that I say, keep them there. Uh, in, and that's kind of, I believe, what Xavi really has truly done with Lamine Mall, because the argument is Lamine Mall, even if he would be a better left winger than Rafinha or more natural there, it still makes more sense to get the best out of Lamine Mall on the right side and lose something potentially on the left than to flip that and have Rafinha give his performance on the right side and then Laminium all, and not say a bad performance, I just mean you try to get the best out of Rafinha on the right, but then you might minimize some of what Laminium all ceiling could be on the right side. And I think Xavi is certainly, he's been very honest with that calculus even before Rafinha had gotten that injury. And again, I agree with you on the Kubar C point. And to that point about what I look for in a pivot and why I have brought up over the last now this season and last season as well in limited time seeing them with examples of Pau Prim and Mark Bernal, who again, Barcelona have two midfielders, one 17 and one 16, who are natural pivots, who've been pivots. Well, not Bernal, Bernal was a little bit forward and now he's been pushed back for the last year and a half and watching him kind of adapt in that role. It's interesting because both of them are more suited, I honestly believe, in kind of this deeper and almost the same thing with Pedri as well, where when Pedri does play deeper, he isn't necessarily physically, obviously he's not going to win the aerial duels and things like that. And I don't know if Pau Prim is either. Bernal is the taller player. And not that you need to be tall, but I think you do need, in a sense, to win those 50-50 balls and those aerial duels, especially if you're going to play in only really the variations of the teams that you play that are going to force you and press you to bomb the ball forward the way that we saw Atletico Madrid do. And if you're going to win those 50-50s, especially you over the course of a long season and multiple seasons and years, you'd want a taller player in that position, which is what Bernal is, which is what Prem and, and a player like Pedri isn't. But again, one of the things for me that always sticks out on Pedri and why I'm comfortable with him in the rare occasions where, especially when the substitute patterns require the pivot to come out of the game and Pedri to drop in deeper, I do enjoy his ball retention, how quickly he can turn on the ball and how quickly he makes decisions under pressure. That is really the two factors that I look for in possession for a defensive midfielder and why I'm so high on Bernal, even more so than Prem. I think Prem has very much like Casado has the tools to be a first team player somewhere. I think they make good decisions and they make them very quick. And that's why I really like those players. And I have no qualms about 
thinking they're going to be in the third division in three years from now. I think they're going to be first division players. But for Bernal, again, it's so raw and inconsistent. So is he ready? Like, should he be thrown into the fire right now for the end of the season? No. But the flashes are there that as a 16-year-old, I believe by 19, which is, I believe, the, the age that, that Busquets was when Guardiola called him up in 2008, uh, 2008, that Bernal is so good at making those quick decisions. And while those diagonals aren't necessarily Busquets level, we're not, we're not comparing him to Busquets. We're saying, can you do enough of a job? And Christensen showing you that even if you do the job of a defensive midfielder, just at its core, if you could do the job of a defensive midfielder, then you're going to get more out of everybody else in the field. And that's why, again, the, the thing about Bernal is he's so far away yet of what is going to be expected of him at the highest level. But to me, over the course of every game I watch him with Barca Athletic, there's eight minutes where I go, that's the guy. And you need to be able to say for 60 minutes, that's the guy. And right now we're at like eight minutes to, I even give him in certain games, 15 to 20. But I'm also worried that in the modern game and the way it is, I find that Pedri, Gabi, Bernal, and Prem, all four of them, to me, operate best in, to your point, a role that doesn't really exist in at least Xavi's Barcelona that Xavi Barcelona is probably best with a natural pivot and then two really successful high interiors with the wings kind of coming in and then getting wide and, and playing that horizontal game. Uh, and potentially with, as we've seen when Ferran Torres has operated well with a number nine who drops in and can help control with build up and be that extra body in the midfield as well alongside those interiors. And you bring the game horizontal as opposed to what has become Xavi's way, which is to make it all vertical, which to your point, Barcelona have succeeded a bit more in recent weeks as they've been more conservative, as the game has been a bit more horizontal, as opposed to constantly just kind of hoop it forward and trust some of your athletes to be the better athletes. And I do find all those things make sense to me as another manager as of now, which uh, if you'd like, I'm going to let you answer that or respond to me first, and then we'll jump into the manager part of it. But as the next manager, I think is watching this tape on what Barcelona is now and what they might bring into these meetings and the recruiting and say, hey, these are the ideas I have for Barcelona. These are the kind of players that would fit my system. It's all those things about a future pivot, I think, in the case of Bernal and Prem, that excite me, but also make me say, I, I, I have to see more. Like they have to, they're obviously going to have to improve, but all of those players kind of worry me because it's, it's not that natural defensive midfielder, natural pivot. I think they all are really successful, almost as box-to-box midfielders, almost as players that not in a sense that they eat up a lot of ground the way like Arturo Vidal would do as a box to box midfielder or be a late runner, but just operate with really good ball retention and really good decisions to control a game in the middle of the field, not necessarily as a pivot and where the game is, as you said, in front of them to a point, but as well as, um, but in the middle of the field and operating kind of in tandem in the way that we expected of Xavi and Iniesta and players that are even more like him. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, obviously, that Busquets was the whole package, and that's basically going to be impossible to replace. So that's why it does come down to the system that is going to be uh, implemented by the next coach, because, you know, the the potential um, profile of that player is, is, you know, it could be a very mobile guy who gets around and is very good at winning, uh, you know, uh, jewels. It could be a guy that's going to stay in one place and just be a, a central you know, hub of possession. It could be a combination of the two. Um, you know, it could be a guy that's that's comfortable playing the short combinations. It might need to be a guy that can play the longer passes. It all just depends on where the team is headed tactically um, because obviously no player right now, apart from De Jong um, in some elements of his game, fill uh, what you'd expect from sort of like a, a, a deepest lying midfielder. So yeah, it's 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 completely going to depend on for me uh, where the team is headed tactically. Well, I, I think back to how much I trumpeted Chiomani when he was at uh, when he was we'll say the, the guy who was linked. And of course, he goes to Real Madrid for a number that Barcelona have not been able to afford and won't be able to afford. And I look at him at Real Madrid and I say, if that player was at Barcelona he's better. He's a better version of himself at Real Madrid than he would have been at Barcelona. Because I think they're very much like the young for Chuamani, that Chuamani is a defensive midfielder. Some of the long balls he plays are awesome. But I think he thrives a little bit better in the same way that De Jong does. I think they, they thrive a little bit better in chaos. And I think FC Barcelona, the players that they recruit, and especially the luxury, we'll say, they have 
to take Kubar C and the mall, uh, Lamini Mall and Hector Fort and the players that have succeeded, which unfortunately we don't really have time to talk about the fullbacks uh, because I think the one thing I'll throw out there is that of the players we talked about, we'll say without Pedri, without De Jong, this run of games, I'm most worried about the future of Balde because that's the one player that I think Barcelona without have been able to find better solutions with Balde out of this team. I don't know how Balde really fits. Maybe he fits in the next guy situation. Maybe it was just a, a confidence thing. Maybe he can refine his form. He's still just 20 years old. So I'm very optimistic about his future, but I do worry about how Barcelona has improved on the wings without Balde in the team. And, and I think that's a discussion for another time. I don't want to do that right now uh, with you. But as I said, the, the big picture, I think, for a player even like Tuamani and De Jong is how they operate in chaos and how that isn't really the, the luxury, again, that Barcelona has to bring up kids from the youth academy straight into the first team because they understand what they're getting themselves into. And if you had, I think that really, not to minimize the whole idea of the economics of La Masia and La Fabrica and comparing the two, which I know uh, fans do until they're, they're dying breath, but kind of compare the two, it is much more difficult for a youth academy player for Real Madrid to jump up into a team that kind of does, as you mentioned, operate in those elements of chaos a bit and is kind of playing through certain players and kind of this is the way we're dictating it and you know don't put too much of your own blueprint because we need Vinny Jr. to do these things and next season we're going to need you to be the guy that is the complementary piece to Mbappe and kind of do your job yes but you have to be really confident in those moments of chaos which as you as kind of it's been the main theme with Barcelona for the last many years I mean dating back to I'd say the day that Ernesto Valverde left is that Barcelona FC Barcelona is incapable of operating in long stretches of chaos in games. And the games that Real Madrid have thrown Barca into chaos, those are the El Clasicos they lose. And the games that, I, that feel more controlled and feel, we'll say, more pragmatic, those are the ones that Barcelona wins. Which transitions me into our final segment here about the managers. Now, on your channel on YouTube, which I will have linked below as I always do, you have gone over a number of names. You've gone over some of the big names that obviously are, we'll say, dreams, but also, who knows? The future is weird, and FC Barcelona, as much as they don't have any money, as much as they seem like they're a mess, it's still FC Barcelona. You still get to live in one of the best cities in the world, and it's great weather and all those things. So you've gone over Inzaghi, you've gone over Klopp, you've gone over Guardiola, but then you've also gone over pretty much the main candidates and the five names and whether or not those fluctuate between how possible or whatever, and some have been bigger names before and thrown out now, but you've gone over all of Michel, Roberto, Desarbi. Julian Nagelsmann, Hansi Flick, Thiago Mata, and I'm going to send people right to your channel, watch each of those individually. I will, uh, as I said to you before we went on the air, I was pretty comfortable with almost everybody else, but your stuff on Thiago Mata was awesome. I really enjoyed it. And I think that because people are not watching, especially if you're a Barca fan, you're not watching Malona week in and week out. That's not happening. And you did the homework for everyone else. And I really enjoyed that video. But I'm going to have to ask you the Barcelona question of this. And I know this might be a YouTube video you do in the future, but hey, uh, you came on here, so you got to deal with it. Between <laughs> Agamata, Flick, Nagelsmann, Desarbi, and Michel, tactically, which of those managers that you went over do you feel comfortable kind of, not to say would be the, the best for the board, because again, there's all the economic things and all the, again, Flick doesn't have a job right now, so he's available, all those different factors, whatever. But if you could just pick one of them and say that manager's tactics align best with what Barcelona has in their current squad and might be able to be the next progression as to what Xavi built, as opposed to, you know, maybe the, even the best man in the long run for the job in the idealistic world that kool want to live in. Um, I'd say there's actually two answers to that question. Uh, and then the two guys in that list that play the football, uh, a style of football, most similar to Xavi and come from the Pep Guardiola school, come from the Cruyff school to some extent, uh, and that's Mitchell of Girona and Deserbi of uh, Brighton. And both of those guys play a positional play system. So it's based on, you know, the spatial logic that the players have been taught by Xavi already, maintain angles and distances between players, create triangles for third man combinations, um, circulate the ball looking for the free man constantly. The, the two implementations of it are quite different. Um, I'd say that Mitchell's is more standard a bit closer to Guardiola and Deserbi is is it's a little bit different because the distances between players are different and he is interested in sort of baiting and creating space 
um, in certain areas of the pitch rather than being able to attack anywhere at any time. So there's a little bit of a difference there, but those two guys for me are the most obvious uh, next step for for this Barca team. And I know that I had a little bit of a conversation with some people on Twitter about Barca DNA and how important that is. Um, but to reduce that conversation to what's important, I think when you look at guys like Yamal and Kubasi and Fermin Lopez coming through, the reason that they can do it so uh, quickly and seamlessly is because the uh, Barcelona Academy La Masia is built on Cruyff principles. So if you want to maintain and ensure that those players can come through seamlessly into a system mm-hmm. and be comfortable with uh, a certain footballing logic that's used, uh, then you want to go with a guy that's that's based their game model on Cruyff to some extent. So yeah, those are the, my two answers to to that question. Yeah, and, and I want to add to that point as kind of what I've been one of the through lines of what I've been talking about and what people on the show have heard me on both YouTube and in the podcast be be kind of trumpeting for the last few weeks and months and actually this whole season. This La Masia generation from what is it the the O sixes, the O sevens, and the O eights as in born, you know, 06, 07, 08, that group to me is the most talented team I've seen in covering La Masia for, for almost 20 years now. That is the most talented group that I've seen just name to name to name to name. And where we usually say, again, one player or two players from each quote unquote generation will come through or at one to two years, you bring in one or two or something, and maybe they get 10 appearances or something and are a squad player. Again, like Alenia broke through to his credit. He was the only one of his generation, if you will, who broke through. But again, even he didn't find a, a, an exact role for a long time. That's why you really do jump from Lamini Mall. I mean, sorry, you went Sergio Roberto and I would argue Ansu Fati, but then after that it was Gabi because even Ansu didn't make it till 21 until he was already on loan and who knows where his future is. So you're really talking about Sergio Roberto all the way to Gabi until you had a, until unless I'm forgetting somebody, um, from the academy who just became a regular and was in the squad and you were going to say, okay, he's one of our cornerstones. And even Sergio Roberto wasn't, like, to call him a cornerstone is, is, is a bit harsh, but he is also the captain of the team and all that stuff. And he was important to Luis Enrique and now we're in the weeds. But I do think to your point, this this next group uh, and, and how you want to make sure you you seamlessly fit them in, I think the idea of Barcelona and the way that they kind of trumpet that propaganda about the academy and fitting them all in, and that's what Barcelona is built by, it's also out of necessity because of financial situation. I think it does behoove Barcelona to kind of, I know it sounds dumb, but to double down on all of those, uh, the ideas and bring in a manager that even though it might, he might not succeed in certain ways that you kind of double down on the idea that, hey, if we can bring in a manager that's going to be aligned a lot with these principles, this will pay off in terms of the academy. And it might not pay off in trophies for next two or three seasons, but I really do. I, I really put my faith in this group of 06, 07, 08 kids. I do think that this group is talented enough that you're going to get, as I said, seven or eight players, maybe not starters, but I think you're going to get seven, eight, even nine first team squad players from that group of that generation. Again, there's already, we've seen Lamini Mall, uh, I mean, Mark Yu, and uh, I mean, Vita Roque is not there. He's been brought in, but you have Mark Yu, Hector Fort, Lamini Mall, Pau Gabarsi. They've already been a part of that. And so you have four, right? So I'm really only talking five more, um, whether it's, again, I've mentioned all the names and I'm doing these YouTube series, uh, these YouTube shorts. So I'm also going to plug here at that point. But I think my only concern about the Zarbi uh, Jaleel is, I, I mean, people don't get to see the back very often, but there's a bit of gray here and I'm worried it's going to be even grayer watching the Zarbi's team. If, if his Barcelona looks the same thing, like his Brighton results, because just since January 27th, they beat, now I'm getting rid of the, the, the one or the one ones or whatever, but multi-goal wins or losses five, two against Sheffield United. They lost four, nothing to Luton town. They beat crystal palace four, one. They, Beat Sheffield United again, 5 0. That was, that was a red card in that one, too. They lost to Fulham, 3 0. They lost to Roma, 4 0. And so it just seems like over the last two months, and that's also a small sample size, but this Brighton team all season long has the ability to, to blow teams off the field or to get completely eviscerated. And when you see those kind of results and you watch a, a manager, even, even Michelle right now, Girona, 
at its best. Everyone's excited. Michelle, oh, what's the next top job he's getting? And now Michelle over the last month and his Girona side, like everyone expected, they didn't have a ne- depth and they didn't have the horses because you just don't. Like those teams, those squads are not built financially to be able to go the distance in a league race unless it really is something truly special like Leicester City was. They just don't have the horses. They don't have the depth. One or two guys go down or guys get, you know, pick up injuries or form, whatever it is. And Girona's results have gone that way. And it's not that you just say blame Michelle, but how much did those kind of things from match to match kind of influence your decision-making on what that manager would be next year? Or do you kind of just throw that out and say, what are their ideas? And these ideas, regardless of the results, how are they going to, you know, those are the ones I trust for next season. Well, I'd say that, you know, there's obviously a lot of reasons for those kind of results. When we look at Brighton specifically, you know, they, they've been, uh, absolutely demolished by injuries and you know they've had to deal with a lot of different um unfortunate circumstances with key players going down and deserby has been making a lot a lot of rotations um in his squad to try and compensate for that i think the there's that the bigger picture with brighton is actually defensively they're not as bad as it seems or it has seemed in the past couple of months um you know in the premier league they've got the fourth best expected goals against So, you know, it's not like they're shipping goals absolutely every single game or every other game. Um, There is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of swings, definitely. And what would, what would worry me more about that is Deserbi being quite dogmatic in his approach and kind of similarly to what Xavi has done is that plan A is usually very good, but plan B doesn't exist because the players are conforming to a very um, rigid system. And, you know, if if they're losing the tactical battle in a game, uh, Brighton this is, there doesn't feel like any um, uh, responsibility from the players to actually make decisions that alter that. They, they're sort of stuck to the, 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 the plan that Deserby has given them. And he is very much an idealist in that sense. So if they concede a goal to a ball over the top, you know, a poorly timed offside trap or whatever, um, they're going to keep doing it. And the players don't feel like they can make those in-game adjustments to, uh, you know, to, to counter that. So in big knockout games, that's an issue. And, you know, to go back to Real Madrid, for example, what you're talking about chaos, you need a little bit of chaos management as, as a top football club that you can get away with not having as a Brighton or a Sassuolo or whatever because your seasons are defined by those games. And if you get destroyed 4-0 in the knockout game, you know, you can't say, oh, well, you know, we've, we're, we're sticking to the ideology here. We'll do that, you know, until, you know, we're, 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 we're kind of, it's, it's do or die in that sense. You know, you, you just can't, you've got to be more pragmatic. And so that is the one thing that worries me from Deserby specifically is the dogma is the, ideology too strong uh to where the players can't make adjustments in in important knockout games now obviously we've only seen him with sort of you know lesser players to an extent so how his approach would would change based on having uh higher quality players in terms of their decision making we don't know but that's just my that is just a concern from from Dezabi for me Well, I I do always find it interesting that when you talk about the, you know, a blowout and being dogmatic, Barcelona, I think, has one of the best examples of all time of that. In when Cruyff lost 4 nothing to AC Milan in the Champions League final there in 1994, that Cruyff basically goes to the board the next day and says, hey, if I'm going to be around, I'm going to, this is, this is me, (laughs) you know, let me or hate me. (laughs) I'm Johan Cruyff, like, these these are my ideas. This is what's happening here and how he's one of again historically one of the best examples of that that he's going he was going to be dogmatic um and then how it's funny to me that younger fans they obviously know about you know johan Cruyff, and i think there's a little less of this as the generations have changed and i, I know that it was the anniversary of his passing a few days ago in in, in the case of Cruyff. and i think the longer time goes on i think the more that those kind of names you're only you got to do only remember their successes and the impact they had and obviously Laporta and Guardiola and what Cruyff meant to them winds up being, you know, kind of, you see his legacy as Guardiola succeed, you continue to see Cruyff in a positive legacy and saving the Barcelona every time they're on the up, 
then Cruyff and the idea of uh, the, D I, uh, the DNA will say, I again, like, it's reductive wording, but you get what I'm saying about the DNA of La Masia. So when you see Lamini Mall and Cabarsi immediately at 16, 17, stepping in the first team, you go, that that's the success of Cruyff. That was his idea. That was his ideals. And then you also, to your point, don't go and, oh, but what about how dogmatically stubborn, I mean, really stubborn, <laughs> read his biography. He admitted himself a hundred times over um, about how, just how stubborn he could be uh, to a fault that, that destroyed relationships and he was stubborn in all aspects of life. And that's kind of was the way he was to uh, very much the dogmatic extremes. Now, last question is about a manager that you have not done yet. And I think it is risky as a fellow content creator. I think it is risky for you to do a full breakdown on Rafa Marquez's Barca Athletic. Like I know that your, your, your YouTube channel did its best and started with Barcelona breakdowns, but it would be risky to do a third division Spanish side <laughs> breakdown. But as much as I think you and I are both concerned about Rafa Marquez, I think a lot of people are concerned about Rafa Marquez as a manager, about being tested and all those things. Whether out of necessity, because as I've been saying too, about the finances required to pay a top, top manager, does RB might not be to take it, you know, as I said, the first question was about idealism. The second part here is just about the sheer money up front. And I think the Nagelsmann thing has been a big part of that. That Nagelsmann, I, I can't see the number he's going to ask for being comparable to what Barcelona can pay. And I, I think the same thing goes for Klopp. I think the same thing goes for Guardiola, that the number they're going to command is not one that Barcelona can give a manager. Because remember, even Xavi is owed money. And whether he takes a fraction of that by... Uh, saying, okay, the renewal that I signed, I'll take a fraction of that or whatever it is, or deferred payments. And they work something out because he loves the club. Great. But as far as the number that they're going to be able to afford, that guy might be Rafa Marquez at the end of the day. And we also know that Laporta, when he has his guys, he has his guys. That's why Garcia Pimienta hit the road, even though he was doing a great job there. Rafa Marquez, it's your job basically to lose. Like, yeah, I'm going to let you fail a little bit more. And of course, Sergi Barzuan was the first option to that. But I think Rafa Marquez was always the guy that Laporta wanted in the way that Deco came in. And we do see that, we'll call it nepotism or the better word would be relationships. So do you think that Barcelona fans maybe a little bit, and again, you and I, I think, can take time to think about this later. And the next time you're on, I could ask him more about this. But do you think that the answer is right in front of their faces. And maybe we're even a little bit too afraid of the idea of Rafa Marquez that, I mean, the, the answer might be just right there. Yeah, it might be. I mean, I, I personally have not seen enough of his Barca Athletic to, to make a decision. You know, I've done a lot of research into these other guys, but I, I, I couldn't tell you really what his, um, uh, what his approach is, is going to be comparatively. But, when it comes to being realistic and it, when it comes to looking at numbers, yeah, I mean, Nagelsmann was, he, he set a world record, I think, for, for the fee that he um, was paid uh, by Bayern Munich when he, when he came in. And, you know, I assume Flick wouldn't be cheap either, although I'm not really uh, a fan of, of the idea of Flick coming in. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's a tough one. It's just, I, I, I'd actually, I, it's something I need to do is go back and, and look at Rafa Marquez's Barca Athletic um, because, you know, without doing that, it's hard for me to give you an answer really. But I think, uh, you know, it's an option that Barca are going to have to consider, obviously. Um, and yeah, if, it, if it's in line with what Laporta wants for the club going forward, if they think it's, it would suit the, the young players coming in because I think that's an important consideration. Can this next guy nurture the, the, the young talents that Barca have? Um, you know, it's, it's definitely something to consider. But yeah, I can't, unfortunately right now, I can't, I can't give a, a solid answer to that. Well, I don't think that I would be able to either. I've watched Barca Athletic tens of times this season and I feel like looking at a team from the third division looking at the players in the squad that they have. Again, even maybe some of our future Barcelona players I mentioned with, with Bernal and, and Gu has been down there a bit and, and even Casa Do and Mika Faye. And we saw Kabarsi at the start of this season and translating all of that from the third division to the first division where everything is quicker and tighter, right? It's, it's so difficult to be able to judge that where I had seen Lamini Mall with the U19s a bit and I saw Paul Kabarsi in the UEFA Youth League. And I'm like, of course, like this kid, you could see it from a minute in this kid has sky high potential despite everybody around him or whatever it is. And yet 
to know if that's going to translate to the first team, it's, it's impossible to know that. And I think the same thing applies to a manager of Martha Marquez that I won't have an answer for you, uh, whether or not, do I trust him? I mean, I'll trust him if he does well with the first team, if he's the game demand for the guy job, I have to, but if he's not the man for the job, I also have to trust that Deco and Laporta and even maybe Rafa Marquez himself makes the right decision to say, well, no, either he's not ready or he may not be the right man for the job. And we need to bring in someone with um, a bit more cachet at a top level at this moment or to handle these pressures or to handle all this. Because as we always know, and I feel like we always forget this in the tactics conversation that being the Barca manager is, what is it, like 50% tactics and 50%, oh my gosh, everything is on fire all the time. <laughs> and just yeah. putting out fires in press conferences and all that stuff. And that's like 50% of the Barca job. And that part wears you down because Rafa Marquez, I can tell you, like being in the U.S. and having grown up being like, gosh, that 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 Mexican legend Rafa Marquez is breaking my heart as much as I like him for Barcelona. It's it's really frustrating uh, with that guy. But I can tell you that Rafa Marquez being the face of Mexican soccer for like 20 years, I I do believe that he can handle that pressure. He was a player at Barcelona as well, dealt with some pressure when before the team was winning champion leagues again. Right. And he was part of that that first journey. So. There's nothing that Rafa Marquez in his professional life has ever shown that he's incapable of handling pressure. So I think, you know, to his credit, I give him some credit on on the idea of him handling pressure. But yeah, then it's all the tactics part. Like, what is he bringing to the table there? At least at least he's living in Barcelona right now. At least he's like in the system, in the program. And he this the players he sent to the first team like Kubarsi, uh, it looks like he's given them at least a, a good pathway. So I, I think there's certainly an argument to be made for Rafa Marquez that I kind of want to. The only reason I say that and throw a monkey wrench in there is because I think I, including, I dismissed him for a little bit uh, of time. And I think almost out of necessity, I have to kind of be more open to that idea and kind of give my reasons as to why I guess it makes sense and why I would kind of have to back him in that way. But speaking of backing, I would back everybody to watch your channel on YouTube, especially. And I know you can never give us any hints as to what you got cooking, but um I always have to ask uh, maybe one or two words or, or what's going, you could even just say tactics, but, but what, what do you got going on over there? Um, you know what? I'm not actually hundred percent sure is the answer to that. I've been obviously in this period of looking at potential managers, uh, for Barcelona and yeah, I, from here, I don't know. Like you, you guys listening to this, let me know what I should, obviously they're all going to say, you know, cover, cover Barca PSG. And I might do that to be fair. Yeah, that's that's a good one to say. I'll probably cover something around uh, the Champions League with uh, Barcelona and PSG, and because that's going to be an interesting one, obviously with Luis Enrique and whatnot. So, yeah, that's likely to be in the works. But otherwise, uh, your guess is as good as mine. Well, yeah, it is certainly a win-win, lose-lose. I, like, how does that all work out, right? If Barcelona absolutely destroys Luis Enrique and Mbappe, like, what does that all mean for Real Madrid's? big signing. What does that mean for Luis Enrique, right? Like would Barcelona accept Luis Enrique back if they beat, if, if he beat them or if he loses, it, right? It's just, there's so many questions about that in the, the big picture too. I mean, as I've said, at least I'm at peace with the idea that Barcelona are in the quarterfinals. And as I said, for Xavi and for this team and for as low as the lows felt for them to be in the quarterfinals, taking on PSG, I can at least sleep going as long as they're not blown off the pitch, right? If they lose on aggregate four three, at least I can sleep well going, all right, all right, this Barcelona team with all the injuries, losing Gabi and everything and Xavi and all the mess and all the drama this season and money, da 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 at least they made the, the quarterfinals that I can sleep well at night as long as I don't have to wake up because Mbappe scored nine goals at the, at the Camp Nou or yeah. something. Or, sorry, at yeah. the, uh, at the at most week. But anyway, Jaleel, thank you so much for coming on. Again, that's the purest across all platforms. You can find his stuff down in the show notes or the description, whether you're listening or viewing. And of course, it's a Barcelona podcast. Ever you may find it. As I want to remind you, if you're still with me at the end of the show, I really appreciate it. And if you're still with me, you probably want to support me. So as low as $3, you can get these shows over on the Patreon page without the ads, which I know take a bit of time there as you're listening on your podcast apps. And then a good rating on the podcast apps and subscribing to the YouTube channel, as well as Jaleel subscribing to him, leaving those likes on the videos. They do wonders. Remember, a lot of the way that we survive is through sponsors, not necessarily through ad revenue. I know you don't. I know younger people may not care about this, or even older people may not care about this. But the way it all works is getting sponsors and being able to lock in that stuff, guarantee that stuff. All of those numbers and metrics that we're able to send over to sponsors, it helps us continue to make our content. So I always remind you again: likes, subscribing. I know it seems like it doesn't matter, but every little bit helps always. And most importantly, though, thanks so much for listening and watching all of our content. We appreciate it. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Force the bars out.